Once upon a time, Apostle Jude provided this tale in his book, Jude 1 verses 6 to 7, regarding angels who did not remain where they should. Instead of remaining in their own private space, they chose to leave. And can you guess where they left? Yes, they left paradise, their magnificent home, for a growing globe named Earth. God bound and imprisoned them because of their actions. They are waiting for a precise day when they will be judged for what they have done wrong. So, invariably, everyone is held accountable for their actions, even angels make mistakes, and when they do, there are consequences. Everyone, including angels, must answer for their actions. To recount this account, Apostle Jude had to travel back more than 2,000 years to the time of the Patriarch Enoch. Chapter 6 of the Book of Enoch recalls an exceptional incident that took place during the reign of Jared, Enoch's father and the sixth generation from Adam. The Watchers, a group of angels tasked with protecting humanity, chose to do something they shouldn't. Instead of just watching, they intended to steal human spouses for themselves. They were driven by a strong desire for these women, and their actions were fueled by emotion. This unlawful mating of angels and humans produced a new species known as the Nephilim. These Nephilim were enormous and powerful, but also ruthless and destructive. They showed no concern for people's lives and caused chaos wherever they went. Because of their opposition and actions, the Watchers were labeled as fallen angels and expelled from their rightful place in heaven. This is when Apostle Peter joins the story. In 2 Peter 2 verse 4, Apostle Peter recounted the following story, Once upon a time, there were angels who rebelled against God, and they did a very horrible and indescribable thing that annoyed God. It stated that instead of forgiving them, God consigned them to a dreadful realm known as Tartarus. So what exactly is Tartarus? Tartarus, according to ancient Greek mythology, was a deep, dark pit beneath the ground where evil creatures were punished. It was a place of darkness and grief, far away from the light. We don't know precisely where Tartarus is, but it's supposed to be a place of torture for people who've done truly bad things. So, when the Bible says God cast the guilty angels into Tartarus, it means they were punished for their transgressions. It so happened that Apostle Peter must have referenced his own story from the Book of Enoch, namely Chapter 10. In antiquity, humanity experienced widespread corruption. It was claimed that Azazel, one of the fallen angels, taught humanity many immoral notions, which led to widespread crime. God spoke with Gabriel and told him to take action against the offspring of fallen angels and those born from illicit partnerships. He ordered their annihilation, ordering them to fight one another until none remained. These souls, expecting eternal life, were denied mercy. God then instructed Michael to bind Semjaza and his associates, who had soiled themselves by marrying human spouses. Their children would die in conflict while witnessing the deaths of their relatives. Following that, they would be obligated for 70 generations until their last judgment. In the end, these culprits would be transported to Tartarus, a flaming pit where they would suffer indefinitely. Those jailed with them would be permanently tied to them. God decreed that all of the Watcher's descendants and reprobate souls be executed for causing harm to humanity. Evil would be eradicated from the globe, leaving goodness and truth to flourish indefinitely. Apostle Jude and Peter told us about the fall and imprisonment of the angels, referencing the Book of Enoch, but what happened next? This is when Apostle John steps in. Once upon a time, an angel blew his trumpet, and something beautiful happened. A star descended from the sky to the ground, bringing with it a key to the enigmatic bottomless hole. When the angel used the key to open the pit, dense smoke spread out, reminiscent of a big furnace. The smoke engulfed everything, obscuring the sun and the air. Swarms of locusts erupted from the smoke, but they were not the typical locusts. They were like powerful scorpions that could sting anyone. However, there existed a law governing these odd beings. They couldn't hurt the plants or trees. They only targeted people who did not have God's holy mark on their foreheads. These individuals were in for a terrible time. The locusts would not kill them, but they would suffer for five months. It was akin to the pain of a scorpion sting, but lasted much longer. In those days, people will long for death, but it will evade them. They will long for an end to their suffering, but death will not provide their request. Now, let me tell you about locusts. They resembled battle-ready horses, with golden crowns on their heads and human-like features. Their hair flowed like that of a lady, and their fangs were as sharp as lions. 
These beasts were iron breastplates and sword with wings that imitated the noise of chariots charging into battle. But wait! There is more! The locusts had scorpion-like tails, complete with stingers. Their potency was to cause misery in victims for five months continuously. So guess what? A king ruled over them. His Hebrew name is Abaddon, and in Greek he is known as Apollyon. He is the angel of the bottomless pit, and he commands these terrifying creatures. One catastrophe had already happened, and two more were on their way. Then something huge occurred. The sixth angel blew their trumpet, and a voice broke out from the golden altar before God. It directed the sixth angel to free for shackled angels who were waiting beside the enormous Euphrates River. These angels were ready to cause havoc. They were supposed to attack for a set amount of time, with the purpose of delivering tremendous harm to one-third of humanity. Their army was vast, with 200 million horsemen preparing for combat. It was a dramatic moment, full of tension and fear, predicting an impending calamity. In a vision, Apostle John saw horses and riders dressed in breastplates made of fire, jacinth, and brimstone. The horses' heads looked like lions, and they emitted fire, smoke, and brimstone. These three killed one-third of humanity with fire, smoke, and brimstone from their tongues. Their power was derived from their serpent-like lips and tails, which caused injury. Even after these plagues, the rest of humanity did not repent for their misdeeds. They continued to worship inanimate idols made of gold, silver, brass, stone, and wood. They also did not repent of their murders, sorcery, fornication, or robbery. It was a time of great discontent and intransigence, with people unwilling to give up their corrupt ways. Tartarus appears in several Bible translations as 2 Peter 2 verse 4. Some translations use hell to represent the place where the fallen angels were cast, whilst others use Tartarus. In Greek mythology, Tartarus was a deep pit that served as a jail of torment and suffering for the evil. It was distinct from Hades, the realm of the dead. In this view, Tartarus is a place of retribution for fallen angels. However, whether Tartarus is analogous to our contemporary understanding of hell is debatable. While both represent places of punishment or suffering, their nature and purpose may vary depending on religious interpretation. Some may regard Tartarus as a distinct realm within hell, while others may see it as a completely independent location. The Bible has several descriptions of what we now call hell. The Bible's diversity originates from its multilingual origins, the Old Testament was written in Hebrew and Aramaic, and the New Testament was written in Greek. Furthermore, both Christianity and Judaism believe in life after death, but they interpret scripture differently, resulting in a wide range of language used to describe the afterlife. As we read the Bible, we come across terms like Sheol, Hades, Gehenna, Abraham's bosom, and Tartarus. Each of these terms represents a unique idea of where souls go after death. Consider the Old Testament notion of hell as being divided into three concentric rings. The outermost circle could be called the realm of the virtuous dead, also known as paradise or Abraham's bosom in the Bible. This is where good spirits awaited the admittance to heaven, which was reserved for those who died before Christ's rescue. Despite its name, hell is not a place of perpetual punishment. The intermediate circle, often known as the abode of the unjust dead, holds souls who did not deserve to be in heaven. It's referred to as Sheol, Hades, or Gehenna. In Luke 16 verses 19 to 31, Lazarus lays by Abraham's side as the wealthy man suffers in Hades across a chasm. The interior of the circle is the prison for fallen angels, or Tartarus, as mentioned in 2 Peter 2 verse 4. This is only for angels that rebelled against God and were exiled from heaven. Questions arise, did Jesus travel to Tartarus? And who did Jesus bring into heaven? Answers vary, but Western Christian tradition says that Jesus descended into the realm of the dead to free the virtuous and fulfill prophesy. I appreciate your viewing.